Uh, my name is Dr. Grant Wilson. I'm the um, I'm the director of the sleep clinic here at the university. Uh, we run our sleep clinic out of the Faculty of Health Clinics. Uh, we've traditionally done a number of lectures. We've run lecture series uh, uh, things, usually in the spring. So we're deep in uh, winter at the moment, <laughs> and I think our numbers are just the hardy of coming up to nine. Um, but um, we'd like to welcome uh, Carmel Harrington uh, tonight, tonight, Dr. Carmel Harrington. She's an Australian sleep researcher who's based in uh, Sydney, and there she works in um, as a researcher at Westmead Hospital, at the Children's Hospital there. She's uh, known for her research into uh, paediatrics and sleep, uh, and uh, sleep and sleep apnea. She did her PhD research with Professor Colin Sullivan at the University of Sydney. And Professor Sullivan, as some of you might know, is the inventor of CPAP therapy, one of the a mass therapy for the treatment of sleep apnea. And uh, he also has a, a good interest in paediatrics also. So Carmel um, has, is a well-known researcher and of late she's been working in the area of metabolic function and uh, sleep and that's an interest of hers that has led her to uh, recently write a book on the, uh, on the topic, uh, the sleep uh, diet. So we're very interested in her insights uh, tonight and hopefully there'll be some practical uh, tips we can take from tonight's presentation which will all see us looking a little slimmer into the future. So uh, we welcome Dr. Harrington. Thank you. Um. Look, I love sleeping and I always love an opportunity to talk about it. I love researching it, I love learning about it and I love doing it. And I've been doing it now, researching for about nearly 20 years. And this may come as a surprise to you, but for all I've known and all I've researched, we actually don't know why we sleep. Now, I think this is a really surprising piece of information. We can put the man on the moon and we're slowly unravelling the mysteries of the Higgs boson. But I can't tell you, and nor can anyone else, why we do something that we do for nearly a third of our lives. So I actually think this is one of the reasons why. Because we don't know the purpose of it, the essential purpose of why we sleep, I think that's one, probably one of the reasons why people don't make it a priority. And bit by bit, our, our culture is sleeping less and less and not giving it the respect that we need. So tonight I want to talk about why it is so essential, uh, especially through the prism of metabolic health. But just so that you leave here tonight understanding that sleep is a priority. But one of the problems, of course, with, with considering sleep as a priority is after all these years of research, if we actually don't know why we sleep, lots of people say, well, is it essential? You know, they're not 100% sure it is essential because we can't find a purpose for it. So this question actually has been beguiling people for quite some time now. And late in the 1800s, 1895, a group of researchers actually totally sleep deprived puppies to see what would happen. Now the puppies died and they died fairly quickly. That research went by the by and nobody really talked about it much at all until the mid-1970s where there was a resurgence in um, sleep research. And uh, a group then took a group of rats and sleep deprived them totally and the rats died. That probably doesn't surprise you given what happened with the pups. However, what might surprise you is just how quickly these rats died. Now if you totally deprive a rat of fluid, of water, they die around about day 14. If you totally starve them, they die around about of food, day 18. If you totally deprive them of sleep, they die around about day 16. Now that puts sleep right square in the middle of the other essential things that we need to do. It's right up there with our need for uh, eating and drinking. Now we know why we would die if we don't drink enough. We know why we would die if we don't sleep and um, eat enough. Albeit that we don't know why we will die if we don't sleep enough, we actually, it is essential to our living. So I would like to start this talk with the premise that it is essential and I will go forward to tell you one of the reasons why it's important to our good health. But I um, actually love this quote by um, Reshafen, who is a grandfather in the research of sleep. And he, in fact, was the fellow that, that um, sleep deprived the rats originally in 1970. But if sleep does not serve an absolutely vital function, then it is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. 
Right, so I accept that and I hope all of you will walk out of here tonight accepting that as well. All right, so sleep is traditionally considered a very inactive state. For, for most, like for millennia, it has been considered as something akin to death, a mini death. Um, and for really up until about 70 years ago, we thought that we were very inactive when we slept. Around about the 1930s, we developed the ability to uh, look at brain waves. And at that point in time, it became obvious that we actually had activity uh, in our uh, sleep, but it was very slow activity. And so around about the 1930s, 1940s, we recognised that our brain didn't stop, that there was still activity when we slept. Over the next 50 years, it was finally worked out that in fact we have um, different states in sleep and we actually have what we now look at as three different and distinct behavioural states. Most of you are very familiar with our wakefulness. And in wakefulness, we spend around about 16 hours per day. And it's not a, a controversial statement of mine to say that we perform essential functions in wakefulness. This is when we eat and we drink. We get rid of our uh, digestive products, our waste products. We exercise our body. So wakefulness, we recognise, is very important for performance of those essential functions to our living. We spend about uh, six hours in non-REM sleep. If we assume a total of eight hours sleep, we spend about six hours in non-REM. And there's a subset in non-REM called our deep sleep. Now deep sleep is really, really important for our metabolic health and it's really important for our feelings of refreshment and vitality. If we don't get enough of our deep sleep, we don't feel refreshed and we don't give our body time to repair and we will probably have poor metabolic health. The other sleep behavioural state we have is REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep and this is the state of sleep that we do most of our dreaming in and this is essential for our cognitive health and our, our mental well-being. So it is now accepted by most people that those, that eight hours that we spend, or most researchers, that eight hours that we spend in sleep actually is essential for those vital functions in the same way as wakefulness is essential for those vital functions. So, and if we don't spend enough time in that sleep, in those different sleep states, we actually will have serious consequences. Now, year on year, one upon month, more and more of these consequences are being found out. But tonight, as I said, we're just going to look at the effect on sleep and weight gain or our difficulty in maintaining metabolic good health. All right, so the study I have up here is actually a seminal piece of research in this story. This study was started um, at the late 1970s and the object of the study was actually to look at the effect of oral contraception um, in the long term. So they enrolled about 70,000 nurses and as a result it's called the Nurses Health Study. And um, in 1986 they started collecting data on sleep. I have to turn around again, I hope you can still hear me when I turn around because this microphone's not attached. But as you can see, it started according to the number of hours you sleep. So here we have less or equal to five hours, six hours, seven, eight and, and nine or greater hours. And here we have 1986 a year, and this is the weight on the y-axis. And as you can see here very clearly, we have the five-hour sleepers with a higher weight compared to down here with the black uh, triangle and the open circle with the lowest weight, and they being the seven to eight hours. So that data very clearly showed there's a dose-related re response to sleep. And so the less you sleep, the more likely you were to have a heavier weight. Now, this was startling. This is the first time the association between sleep and weight was made. And it's very powerful data because there's 70,000 people in the study. Now, these women were followed for the next 15 years, or 16 years actually, and what they found is that trend continued. And so by the end of the 16-year study, it was found that if you slept five hours or less, you were much more likely to put on an incredible amount of weight over that 16-year period and it was a dose-related response. So the less you slept, the more weight you put on, and um, the less likely you were to lose weight. So this study was conducted in the US, and many of us like, in, in many ways, when we do our study, um, we often think, oh, that country's that country, it doesn't apply here. 
And sometimes we make the mistake of thinking of America as being a little bit of the fat nation. So we, we might try to excuse that study in that regard. But because this was such a startling piece of evidence, um, there was loads and loads of studies done in all different cultures all around the world. And here we have a combination of all those studies. It's called a meta-analysis. And what they've looked at is they've combined studies um, all around the world in different cultures with a total uh, participant number of over 600,000 um, 600, people. And what a meta-analysis does is look at the odds ratio. So here we have the line one here. If it's on the uh, left-hand side, it means that there's a decreased risk of obesity with short sleep. And if it's on the right-hand side, there's an increased risk of short sleep, uh, of obesity with short sleep. And as you can see here very clearly, all bar one study, which is here, show a very clear increased risk of obesity with uh, short sleep. So that's really powerful. We have over 600,000 people in this study throughout the world, all very consistent result. So very clearly, the, the uh, population studies show us that short sleep is associated with uh, incident obesity. The end result of that, the, the combined information from that study was that adults who sleep five hours or less have a 60% increase for the risk of obesity compared to adults who sleep more. These researchers also looked at children. I'm not going to go into that as well, but unfortunately that trend is very clear in, in children as well. And I'm talking about prepubertal children. So those children who sleep less than 10 hours per night are twice as likely to be obese as those who sleep the required 10 hours. Now I work in, um, in the children's hospital and we have a real big problem with obesity and overweight children. And at the moment, Australian children, about 25, 20 to 25% of Australian children are either overweight or obese. So we need to start thinking about different interventions we can do with these children and to actually understand what the problem is. So this is one piece of the puzzle. All right, so the data is very clear now that we, um, that short sleep is associated, population data-wise, with incident obesity. But if I say to you, 60% of Australians are overweight or obese, that's our statistic right now, so 60% overweight or obese. If those 60%, very few actually had short sleep, so if only there's a handful of people that had short sleep, it's not actually impacting that figure. Right, so if we didn't have a lot of people in the population having you know, six or seven, six hours sleep a night, then that's not one of the factors affecting our obesity epidemic. But I think there's some interesting facts that we need to be aware of. The chronic sleep deprivation is a behaviour that's only been occurring over the last 50 years. In 1960, a, a very large population study was undertaken, and the purpose of that was to see if there was any antecedents in the diagnosis of cancer. And one of the bits of information they collected was how much we slept. And what they found in that study was that the mean sleep time was eight and a half hours. Fast forward 35 years, and the modal sleep time had dropped to seven hours and 40 minutes. 15 years on from that, our weekday average is six hours and 20 minutes. So that means in little over 50 years, we've decreased our average sleep time by 25%, 20 to 25%. Now, this is one of the reasons I asked you to take as a premise that sleep is an absolutely vital function, otherwise it's the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. Right, if we accept that, in the last 50 years we've changed it by 25%, there's sure to be consequences. And in fact, we're just starting to unravel it now. And at the same time, over that 50 year period that we've actually decided to drop our sleep, there's been nearly a threefold incidence in the uh, incidence of, um, of obesity. If we bother to, to map uh, decreasing sleep times against our uh, increasing obesity, you can see a very nice crossover here around about 1995. Now, that is, any one of you would say, that's a little bit simplistic because in that post-war years, we've actually had an explosion of food. We've got so much fast food, we don't know what to do with it. 
the ubiquitous use of the car, public transport. So we've had an increase in food consumption and a decrease in exercise, which is a, a weight gain situation. So even though we can see that our decreasing sleep is associated with um, increasing waistlines, we actually need to understand what, what are the potential causal mechanisms that would make this happen. Because if we can't find any of those, then maybe it is just the food, and maybe it is just the lack of exercise. So we know though that there are some very clear behavioural effects of sleep deprivation that actually will impact our ability to maintain a disciplined approach to a lifestyle change, which dieting would, would require. The first two of those are poor mood state and depression. Now if you think back to the last time that you didn't get enough sleep, you probably didn't feel very vital. You probably didn't feel very happy. You probably didn't feel like making the effort to diet and you'd sort of grab the biscuit or whatever because you actually can't be bothered to be more disciplined. So poor mood state and depression are, not, are associated with poor food choices. Also, a lack of sleep is known and has been found by research to be associated with lack of motivation, poor decision making and increase in risk taking. So, those sorts of behavioural deficits actually make implementing any lifestyle changes like dieting or being disciplined in your approach to food very difficult. But I'm going to leave that to one side. There's a lot of data around those five things and m much more in, in regard to the behavioural deficits. But where my area of interest really lies is at the cellular level. So what is happening at the cellular level that may account for the association between lack of sleep and um, weight gain. There is at least three physiological pathways that's out there, but I'm only going to talk about three tonight. The first one is that in situations of uh, poor sleep or lack of sleep, we actually get a deregulation of our appetite hormones. We have neurocognitive changes and we have decreased energy expenditure. Now I'm just going to look a little bit at those three and I think you'll just be amazed at the research that is out there that actually really hasn't been disseminated very well in the public domain. This group here, the Spiegel group, have been, sorry, the Spiegel group here, have been very influential in a lot of the work they've done and, and pioneers at this cellular level. What they looked at um, and it was on the back of the population data. They wanted to see what, well, what was happening with the person themselves. Forget about the population, forget about the generalities, what about the specifics? So they took a group of healthy young men and put them through three different um, sets of uh, lab situations. The first one here, they allowed them, they slept for four hours on average for six days, and this is their sleep time here. The second group slept for seven hours, second time, and this is their seven hours here. And this time they slept for nine hours and that's their um, time there. And as you can see, they then looked at this thing called leptin. Now leptin is an appetite hormone. Leptin is a hormone that makes us feel full. So if we don't have enough leptin in our system, we actually don't, we don't feel full and we want to keep eating. All right? So it's our satiation hormone. So what they looked at was the levels of leptin. So how full did these people, would they feel? And as you can see very clearly, I love showing research like this because it's very obvious what the results are. What they found was that the, in the very short slept situation, the leptin at 9 o'clock in the morning was very much lower than that from the 7 hour group and the 9 hour group. And it was lower throughout the day because the area under the curve is much, much lower. So this meant that when these young men woke up at, in the morning, their desire for a big breakfast was really high. Because right, they were very hungry. It took a lot of calories to make them feel full because they didn't have enough leptin in their system. And that pursued throughout the day. So you can see here, from 9 o'clock in at the morning to 9 o'clock in the morning here, throughout the day their, their secretion of leptin was much lower than the, when they were 7 hours slept or when they were 9 hours slept. So that was the first hint that there was something really going on um, at a cellular level that was causing this weight gain problem. Now this group, as I said, has been very instrumental in some of the studies and they continued this work and published this in 2007. And as you can see here, they have this uh, leptin, oh sorry, 
they have leptin here, minus 18%, so that when you're in the short sleep situation, you're actually producing much less leptin. But what you produce a lot more of is this wonderful thing called ghrelin. Now, you know what ghrelin does? It makes you hungry. The more ghrelin you have in your system, the hungrier you are. For those of you here tonight who haven't had dinner, you've probably got a lot of ghrelin going around your, in your, your, your body, telling your brain and your body that you're very hungry. So the combination of decreased leptin and increased ghrelin means that you're very hungry and you're hard to fill up. So it's a fatal combination. And so what this meant was in the, the short sleep situation, these people were requiring something like 23% more calories than they did in the well slept situation. So the problem though is that they weren't desiring lettuce and carrots and apples and all those good foods. They wanted and they nominated chips, hamburgers, ice cream. They wanted the rich, dense carbohydrate foods. And in fact, this is what they, they rated here. 32% increase in their desire for those sorts of foods. Now, that's a very bad situation for anyone who wants to lose weight. And these young men, um, and as, as healthy as they were, they were eating between 300 and 500 calories extra per day just because of their short sleep, because it was a metabolically controlled study. So very quickly, that would result in weight gain. So we could say then that if you knew short sleep was going to make you hungrier, you could say, well, you just have to be more disciplined. You have to be aware of it and make a conscious decision not to eat the extra calories. Good enough, you know, remind yourself that it's only, you know, this, these hormones running around my body, I really don't need it. But there's more to the story than that. So what we need to do is just have a look at what goes on in our brain when we sleep. There's the brain. Um, I'm going to talk about two structures in our brain for the moment. There's lots that goes on in our brain when we sleep, so don't think this is the only thing. I just think this is what's relevant for tonight's talk. I'm going to talk about what's called the amygdala. Now the amygdala is a very old structure in our brain and it's re responsible, it's where we have our emotions, that's where we learn, that's where we bed down emotions and that's where our emotions come from. If you don't have an amygdala, you don't learn emotions, you don't know love, you don't know fear. And we're actually learning a lot about the amygdala because there's a woman in the USSM, she's referred to in the literature, if anyone's interested, because she had a um, congenital uh, deficit and she's slowly lost the amygdala function. So she doesn't know fear. There's a, all, all lots of interesting articles about her. Anyway, so the amygdala is very important in this story. And the other area I'm going to talk about is the anterior cingulate, which is part of the medial prefrontal cortex. Now this is, the prefrontal cortex is the newest, the most newly evolved part of our brain. And um, not many creatures have such a developed prefrontal cortex. It's mostly primates. This is different to the amygdala, which is a very old part and nearly all creatures, even a lizard, has an amygdala. Now these areas of the brain are very activated during sleep. They're more active in sleep than they are awake, which is just simply amazing, I think. The anterior cingulate is responsible for putting a break on our emotion. Now if we didn't have the, the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate, we would be shouting out every time we got annoyed. So if we were sitting in a shop and somebody's um, taking a really long time to complete their transaction, we're running late, we actually would be shouting at them, hurry up, because we had no, no break. The anterior cingulate normally breaks us from doing that. It, it modifies our social behaviour. Okay, so they're two very important parts of the brain which actually are very highly activated <coughs> in sleep. All right, so keeping those two things in mind, Let's look at the latest bit of research. Now this research came out just last week and it was fantastic information. What these researchers did is they looked at two areas of the brain, the anterior cingulate and the uh, amygdala, which are, have been characterised previously, the anterior cingulate for being important in food evaluation and the amygdala for appetite desire. 
So that's already been characterised. Even before we even started think, talking about sleep, that's been characterised as important, the anterior cingular in our evaluation of food choices, and the amygdala in our appetite desires. Right, so what they then did is allowed a group to sleep for eight hours, and they looked at another group that were totally sleep deprived for 24 hours. They had continued wakefulness for 24 hours. And then they looked at what was happening in the anterior cingulate. Now on the uh, left hand side is the well slept group. And as you can see here, it's a lovely bit of activity in the area of the brain. They did functional MRIs on these people at the time when they were, when the functional MRIs were conducted when they were looking at food and food portions. So they were looking at their brain, scanning their brain, while they were looking at images of food. So looking at the response in their brain, the activation in those brain areas. And as you can see here in the well slept group, there was nice activity in the anterior cingulate. So this well slept group theoretically could make evaluate, value, evaluate their food choice. And if you look on the other side, the um, people who had no sleep, there's undetectable activity in the anterior cingulate. So there ability to evaluate a food choice has almost gone to sleep, all right? So perhaps that's not the best situation to be in. But if we then look at what happens with these people in the amygdala, it's a lethal combination, I can tell you. So as you can see here in the well slept group, we've got a little activation in the amygdala, which is what you expect because there's an appetite desire going on. But look at the response in the sleep deprived group. So do you think they give much consideration to grabbing the chocolate bar after not sleeping or not? Do you think they even think about it? Is there any value judgment going on there? No, the brain's not allowing them. That brain actually has put that part of the brain to sleep. That part of the brain's not really working that well. So people, we might say you must be more determined, you mustn't eat that chocolate biscuit or you mustn't have that hamburger. But the brain's not on their side. Because you haven't allowed the brain to do the work in its sleep, it's going to do it during the day. All right? So it's really important to understand it's more, sleep is so essential to us that our body will make sure we'll get what we need in sleep, even in the wakeful hours. All right, so I, I sort of feel like when I give lectures like this, like the lady with the steak knives, because there's always more. All right, because so far what I've told you is enough to account for the increase in weight when we short sleep. But the, another very important part of this story is that when we don't sleep sufficiently, our body drops its metabolic rate. To understand the importance of that, we actually need to understand what the equation of weight maintenance is, because this is critical to uh, weight loss. So obviously we have energy consumed, or the food, has to equal our basal metabolic rate. Now our basal metabolic rate is what performs our vital functions. That's the thing that allows us the blood to run out, supplies the fuel for the blood to run out around our system, it supplies the fuel for um, keeping our temperature regular, keeping us warm. So they're the essential functions of the body and that takes up about 60% of our intake for the day, assuming weight maintenance uh, calorie intake. The next thing that we use energy for is what we call diet-induced thermogenesis. Now this is the energy we use to digest our food. Now many of us will have had the experience that when we're eating we start to get hot. That's because we're burning calories. We're burning calories like we do in a, um, the oven because we're burning the food that we're eating. And so we're bedding that down and using it as fuel. So we use about 10% of our calories to do that. The other thing that we use calories for is our active metabolic rate. Our active metabolic rate is allowing you to sit there, it's allowing you to, me to move around, to stand, to sit. So we use about 30% of our calories to just do those um, regular daily activities. You might up the usage of your active metabolic rate if you decided to go to the gym for an hour or go for a marathon or whatever. But generally, if you're just doing normal sedentary uh, lifestyle, the AMR um, accounts for about uh, 30%. 
So with um, weight maintenance for adult women, it's about 1950 calories and ad adult men's about 2,500. Now if you want to lose weight, obviously, your energy consumed has to be less than those three together. Okay, so that's simple, it's pretty simple. If we want to lose weight, we have to have less input than we have output. And then we have to access our energy stores. Time immemorial. For any person to diet, all we've ever concentrated on is the energy consumed. So normally what we do is decrease the energy consumed and we increase the AMR or we increase that exercise component. Because until very, very recently, we thought the BMR was immutable. That was it, 60%, that was all we could do with the BMR. We actually thought that about the uh, diet-induced thermogenesis as well. That's changed also, but I'm not going to go into that tonight. But so we never realised, we didn't realise that perhaps the BMR could change. So let's look what happens with energy when we are sleep deprived. Now that we understand the, the equation of weight maintenance. So what they did, again, is they allowed two sets of, um, a group of people came in and had two different um, times in the lab. One stage they slept for eight hours and another time they didn't get any sleep at all. And they looked at their basal metabolic rate. So as you can see here, in the conditions of good sleep, their basal metabolic rate was around about, I don't know, 5.6, 5.8, 5.9. And here, uh, when they're not sleeping at all, it drops down to about 5.5, which is a drop of about 5 to 6% on your basal metabolic rate. If we then look at what happens to their diet-induced thermogenesis, so when you look at that, what you do is your basal rate goes up above. Okay, so if you're if your basal rate of metabolism is around about, say it's you know, there, about 6, when you have diet-induced thermogenesis, it will go up to 7.6 or 8, depending on how much you're expending. So as you can see here in the graph, they've got this down at the basic zero. That they just normalised that there. As you can see, in the after breakfast, they looked at the uh, increased uh, metabolic rate due to DIT, because the, the, the group actually ate their breakfast. And so what you can see here, is in the well-slept group, they had a lovely increase in their, um, the, the metabolic rate. It went up by about 1.6. But in the group that had maintained wakefulness and didn't get any sleep at all, it dropped by about 20%. Right, so their diet-induced thermogenesis, so their metabolic rate dropped um, by comparison to when they were sleeping well. The, end, the combined result of that is in the poor slept, in the inadequate sleep situation, the metabolic rate overall dropped by 10%, which is a massive drop. There's nothing else has changed except their sleep. Now traditionally people think, oh well, you know, these people have put on weight because they've been up longer and they've had more opportunity to eat. You know, it's got nothing to do with it. That might be one little bit of the picture, but there's a whole lot more here going on. So if we understand that when we do not get enough sleep, our metabolic rate drops as well, we have a situation where you're really battling uphill to lose weight if you're not sleeping well. Because I'm now going to combine all the information that we've got into a person and see what happens with the person. So remembering our equation, right, BM, uh, energy consumed has to be less than our BMR, plus diet-induced thermogenesis and plus that activity. In the well-slept woman, all right? So the well-slept woman consumes 1,950 calories. She's happy with her weight, she's maintaining her weight. It's a weight maintenance diet. 60% of her calories are used for just maintaining her vital functions, which is that many. 10% is used to digest her food and 30% for her activity. Luckily, she comes and uses her 1950. What a wonderful sum that is, okay? So she's result has maintained her weight. Now let's look at the poor woman who night after night, for whatever reason, is getting, you know, five and a half, six hours sleep. She also wants to be on a weight maintenance diet. That's her ideal. 
So she consumes 1,950 calories, but somehow or other through the day she consumed an extra 300 because she didn't think about it. You know why? Because she didn't sleep well and she had her deregulated appetite hormone profile. So instead of sleeping, eating 1950 and stopping, she added the extra 300, which we know happens because of the increase, the decreased leptin and the increased ghrelin. So her total calories consumed was 2,250. So somehow or other, she's going to have to do something to consume those extra calories. But the poor thing, instead of having 60% of her calories being used BMR, only 50% because her body's in the energy conservation mode because it hasn't slept enough. So instead of using the 1170 calories that the well slept person uses for their BMR, this person only uses 975. Their DIT remains the same, their AMR remains the same. So the total consumption is 1755. So she's actually got left over 495 calories in excess at the end of the day. So of course, the woman on the right, left hand side has got weight maintenance. The woman on the right hand side has weight gain. And this might be a really startling piece of information. But extra calories on just two days a week is enough to promote a weight gain of about six kilos a year. All right, two days a week. So if you have poor sleep just two days a week and you, you do those, have those results, then you're going to put on weight very quickly. Now again, this person says, okay, I can't get to sleep anymore because I've got so much work going on and I know I eat when I shouldn't eat because I get so hungry and I eat it and I know it's my appetite hormones and I know it's my neural pathways. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to up my AMR. I'm going to start running an hour a day to use up those extra calories. That's possible. You can do that. You can actually up your AMR. You can start running marathons. Who's, who's ever seen a fat marathon runner? You know? Of course you can do that. But again, there's a, there's a twist to the story. And to understand the twist, we have to go back to the brain. Oh, now this is a really interesting story. Here we have the hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus we have something called the hypocretin system. Now the hypocretin system, in about um, 1998, they found that if we stimulate, this area was found about 1998, they found if they stimulated that system there, they actually got enough regulation of appetite, we increased our appetite. This is the part of the brain that leptin and ghrelin act on. Right? So those are the appetite hormones we're talking about. This is the part of the brain that they act on. They act on the feeding centre. And so, in 1998, everyone was very excited. This is a feeding centre. This is going to be the new weight loss thing. You know, we're going to be able to work out what to do because we now find what part of the brain actually upregulates appetite. So therefore, if we know what upregulates, of course, we know what downregulates as well. That was great information. So that part of the brain controlled how much we ate. However, the story didn't remain like that for very long, as it never does. In 2001, there's a, a thing called narcolepsy. I don't know how many of you know about narcolepsy, but it's uncontrolled sleepiness. Now, these people can sleep up to 20 hours a day. They will fall asleep. They'd be asleep now. You know, they, they fall asleep all the time. It was found out that these narcoleptics had in their feeding centre a huge deficit. They have about a 10% of the normal function. All right? so, and that was causing their uncontrolled sleepiness. So they had a really big deficit in the what they thought was the feeding centre. What it now obviously was, this controlled how much we slept. So the deficit in the feeding centre actually was causing their uncontrolled sleepiness. So not only did this feeding centre control how much we ate, it also controlled how much we slept. That was fine, but there's a bit of a conundrum there. Okay. If you have a, a down regulation of the feeding centre, we know you have a down regulation of your appetite. Right? You're not as hungry because it's not as active. So theoretically, these narcoleptics, these people with narcolepsy, should undereat, and they should be underweight as a consequence. It was true that they underate. They eat far less than the normal population because their feeding centre is under regular, underactive. But guess what? They were twice as likely to be obese. 
Now, that didn't make any sense at all to anyone. They didn't eat as much, they had a down regulation of their feeding centre, but they were twice, and they slept all the time, they were twice as likely to be obese. And it wasn't until recently that we found out that that centre there is involved in our um, homeostasis. It can, that centre there feeds into other parts of the hypothalamus and it decides how quickly we burn calories. So what it in fact does is affect our spontaneous exercise or our AMR. So it actually down-regulates that 30% of AMR right down so these people can maintain their body weight and in fact put on body, body weight. So it turns out that even though we have you know, really smartly decided that it was only food and exercise that are in the BMR, in the weight uh, equation, indeed it's not that at all. Sleep figures really highly in it, like really, really highly. And we're just beginning to understand that. So it's really important if the brain puts it all together, then who are we not to recognise that there's three pillars of health, not two? It's not just nutrition, it's not just exercise, but it's sleep as well. Now I'm not saying, and I would, you know, I would never want to be quoted as saying if you sleep well you're going to be slim. You know, life's not that simple. But if you don't sleep well, you're not going to be slim. That's what I can say, alright? So our good health and well-being is predicated on good nutrition, good exercise and good sleep. And I think what's happened over the years, we've actually left something go that's very precious. You know, I was talking to a group of school students the other day and I was saying, you know, the world doesn't switch off anymore. I said, when I was a kid, TV would switch off. You know, I don't know, some of you may remember that like at 12 o'clock or, you know, 11 o'clock, we say, good night, we'll see you tomorrow morning, and you get the test pattern. And these kids had this look of horror. What? The TV went off? I said, not only did the TV go off, the radio stations went off, and if anyone rang you after 9 o'clock at night, there must have been a death in the family. And this look of horror on their faces. And I said, yes, the world used to switch off. It doesn't switch off anymore. And because it doesn't switch off anymore, we've let sleep go. We've let it slip out of our hands. And because, as I said at the start, I can't tell you why we sleep. I cannot tell you the reason why we will die if we don't get enough sleep. But we know that sleep is essential and we've let something really precious out of our hands. And I think it's time, <laughs> clearly I think it's time, to get up and start to talk about this everywhere. It's not just get off the, the couch, it's not just make the good food choice, it's actually making the priorities sleep as well and making sure you get enough. All right, so thank you very much for being here tonight and I appreciate it very much. Thank you.